What I have for you today is a brief discussion of the examples for Pillar 2 calculations from uh, 2022 from the OECD. And the summary in short is it just illustrates the complexity of Pillar 2 and it very much is a document about accounting, tax accounting. I am a lawyer, so I am really on slippery ice here. So if we have a look at the table of contents, you can see they discuss the, the Pillar 2 legislation by article, and they give a number of examples for the articles. And just to remind us what the different articles are, here, the, here is the table of contents of the Pillar 2 legislation. So you can see Pillar, uh, Chapter 2 deals with the charging provisions, so who pays the, into the, the, the IIR. Pillar 3 examples deals with how do you calculate the globe income or the loss. And the pillar four, uh, chapter four examples talk about your cal calculation of your adjusted covered taxes because obviously if you if you want to calculate your effective tax rate you're going to need to know what your taxable income was and what the what the tax itself was right and once you know that you can do your calculation of your effective top-up tax and uh, the amounts applicable for the UTPR and that's what the, the chapter five examples deals with. And then when things get complicated with uh, chapter six on restructurings and holding structures, they have one example. And for chapter seven on neutrality and distribution regimes, again, the transparency type of entities, um, they have some, some, some further examples. The, the introduction to the, to the work says that this document sets out a number of examples that illustrate the global rules. The examples are intended to be used for illustrative purposes only and do not form part of the commentary. Additional examples developed and published may be developed and published in the future. And one can only say, yes, please, please do give us more examples. And, and the comment on uh, the examples are intended for illustrative purposes only. I wonder how would one interpret that if one were to try and interpret the Pillar 2 rules and the commentary on the rules under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Uh, maybe not applicable, but maybe it also is. Let us have a look at the, at the, at the examples themselves at a high level and, um, and leave it at that for now. So the OECD starts us off nice and easy. They start with Article 213 and they show us a diagram you can see ACO is not in a globe country rule, so there's no IIR rules. BCO does have IIR rules, and BCO 1 and BCO 2 are each owned 100% by ACO, and they both own 50% in CCO, which does not have um, globe rules and is a low tax jurisdiction, right? So, and then the question is, what, is, what does 213 say? Well, just to remind us, 21 deals with application of the income inclusion rule and it says the ultimate parent owner, uh, an entity that owns an interest, ownership interest in a low tax constituent entity, in this case CECO, shall pay a tax equal to its allocable share of the top up tax. So ACO should pay 100% of the top up tax of CECO, except ACO doesn't, uh, country A doesn't apply the IIR. So then let's see what 2.2 say. 2.2 says an intermediate parent that owns an ownership interest in a low tax constituent entity shall pay a tax in an amount equal to its allocable share of the top of tax. So BCO1 and BCO2 should pay this, except that they say 2.2 shall not apply if the ultimate parent entity of the M&A group is required to apply, to apply the qualified IIR for that fiscal year. In other words, the top-down approach, but ACO is not required, so it still means that BCO1 and BCO2 should pay, or another intermediate entity that owns the controlling interest in the intermediate parent entity is required to pay for that qualified IIR, and there are no other intermediate parent entities, so BCO1 and BCO2 must each pay 50% of the top of tax of ACO. This is what you owe CECO, and this is what you see what the solution is. In, 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 in the 2022 uh, examples, ACO is the ultimate parent entity and would have the priority to apply the IIR rules under Articles 211 and 213. However, only country B has introduced qualified IIR and thus the intermediate parent entities BCO1 and BCO2 are, are required to apply the IIR 
BICO 1 and BICO 2 must apply the IIR in accordance with Article 212 based on their allocable share of the top-up tax. So they need to pay the top-up tax. If we now change the facts a little bit, and now you see that um, ACO is still not uh, implementing the IAR, and BICO 1 actually holds 20% of BICO 2, and BICO 2 now holds 90% of the shares in SECO, and BICO 1 only holds 10% directly, right? So, so the question is, how does this change the solution? And, and, and the OECD tells us in this case, it is assumed that BICO 2's allocable share of SECO's top-up tax is 90%, and that BICO 1's allocable share is 10% plus 18% through BICO 2, right? Because 20% um, of 90% is 18%. However, to avoid double taxation, Article 2.3 requires BICO 1 to reduce the top of tax attributable to its indirect ownership in SECO by the amount that will be brought in charge by BICO 2. So BICO 1 must pay top of tax, but only to the extent that it effectively directly owns the shares in uh, SECO. And, and, and if we look at what 2.3 says, it says a parent entity that owns an ownership in a low-tax constituent entity indirectly through an intermediate parent entity. So in other words, BICO owns SECO, BICO 1 owns SECO through BICO 2. That is not eligible for exclusion from the IIR. In other words, BICO 2 must pay income inclusion, uh, the top of tax, shall reduce its allocable share of top-up tax of the low-tax constituent entity in accordance with Article 232. And 232 says the reduction of 231 will be an amount equal to the portion of the parent entity's allocable share of the top-up tax that is brought into charge by the intermediate entity. In other words, out of the 28%, 18% is brought into charge through BICO2, and therefore that 18% does not have to be paid by BICO1, and thus uh, double top-up tax taxation is avoided. A 10-second commercial. If you want to learn more about international taxation or transfer pricing, or treat yourself to an all-round update, or if you want your team to learn or stay updated, please visit my online courses. In our next situation, we're going to look at Article 215, and it deals with partially owned parent entity. So you can see an example here on the left. ACO is an IIR country which holds 60% of BCO, which is an IIR country, but 40% is held by third parties. And SECO is in a IIR country and, 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 and is held 100% by BCO and then holds DCO, um, which is not in an IIR country or a global country. Um, and, and now the issue is if, if ACO were to apply the, the IIR rules, it should only apply it for 60% of the income of DECO because that's what it's entitled to, right? But you've got BCO and SECO in the middle, which own 100%. And the question is whether they shouldn't apply the IIR to 100% to, to, to and that is what Article 214 deals with. It says, notwithstanding Article 211 to 213 that we just looked at, a partially owned parent entity that owns, and so we're talking here about uh, BICO, for instance, directly that owns directly or indirectly, and SECO is also a partially owned entity because they are uh, shareholders in BICO, that owns an interest in a low-tax constituent entity, shall pay a tax in an amount equal to its allocable share of the top-up tax. Now, BICO and SECO holds 100% of DECO, so they should pay 100%, right? And now the question is, which one should pay it? And, and 215 says, Article 214 shall not apply if the partially owned parent entity, in other words, SECO in this case, is wholly owned for 100% by another partially owned parent entity that is required to apply the qualified IIR. So in other words, again, it's a kind of a top-down approach, but then from the first partially owned entity, because in this case, that would be BICO, right? If we look at the solution, it says, in accordance with Article 214, a Pope is required to apply the IIR, notwithstanding that the UPE is also required to take it to apply the IIR. Thus, both BICO and SECO would be required to apply the IIR under 214 because both of them are partially owned in, um, uh, uh, entities, right? However, 215 that we just looked above 
restricts SECO from applying the IIR because it is wholly owned by another pope. In other words, you take the top partially owned entity, BICO. Consequently, BICO applies the IIR in accordance with 214 and pays a, ta a tax equal to 100% of the top up tax of DECO because it owns DECO for 100%. And then the six says what, whatever happens about the UPE. The existence of a Pope does not preclude the UPE from also applying a qualified IIR, so there's potentially a double top up tax. However, the IIR offset mechanism and the two three requires the UPE to reduce its, po uh, its allocable share of the top up tax. And this is two three that we just looked at in the previous slide as well, just as a reminder. So it says that you know you can you can offset whatever you should pay against what your subsidiaries have paid already. So so this is an interesting rule because it says that if there is partial ownership somewhere in the group, then you go to the top partially owned entity and they still have to pay 100% or as many as, as however many percent you own in the, in, in the under tax entity um, in top up tax, right? So you don't get away by saying, ultimately I only own 60%. You still need to pay the full 100%. Let's look at one other example in, in this regard. So what happens if now we don't have one partially owned entity, but two entities which are partially owned? And in this case, the solution changes because we need to look at the wording of Article 215, right? Article 214 shall not apply if the partially owned entity is wholly owned by another partially owned entity. And that is not the case for us now because SECO is not wholly owned by BECO anymore, right? So the solution now is under this scenario, Article 215 does not restrict SECO from applying the IIR because it is not wholly owned by another Pope, right? It is only owned for 90% by BECO. Therefore, SECO applies the IIR under 214 with respect to 100% of the top up tax to DECO. So it now pays 100%. Um, in this case, BICO is still required to apply the IIR in, in accordance with 214 and is not restricted by 215. However, the IIR offset mechanism of 23 again kicks in and it would eliminate any potential double tax due by ACO or BICO in their application of the IIR with respect to DECO. Right? So it's always the, the lowest... Um, partially owned entity, directly partially owned entity, which ends up paying the full brunt of whatever it is that the companies share in, 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 in the low tax entity um, and ownership. And then it is also important to remember that even though the main rule is that you always start the IRR from a top-down approach, you always start at the ultimate parent entity. And if it is not subject to tax, you go to the next intermediate entity and if it's not subject to tax you go to the next one actually there is another rule and this is the pope rule right which which trump the ultimate parent entity rule because even though you normally start with a top-down approach when you have a partially owned parent entity you need to start with a partially owned parent entity first so that you can allocate as much of the top-up tax to that partial owned parent entity first before you go further up the chain and look at an ultimate parent entity with regard to other low taxed entities. So it is not true that you always start at the ultimate parent entity. You only start at the ultimate parent entity if there are no partially owned parent entities in the group, in the chain. That is what I have for you on the scope of IIR um, application for, 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 um, for the examples from, from the OECD document. I hope it gives you some idea of, of the complexity on something as simple as scope of applying the IIR. The, the examples conclude, include far more examples, much more complex on other articles. I would highly recommend that you have a look at those uh, when you have time if you are going to be dealing with Pillar 2. And uh, next week we will deal with another court case on transfer pricing or international tax again. Hope to see you then. Bye for now.